this last section of our lecture is going to talk about primate evolution. And so to kind of set the stage for primate evolution, we need to recognize that I mean, the history of life on Earth is incredibly extensive. I mean, we've uh, we've got life dating back to at least 544 million years ago. Um, the Earth itself dating to over 4 billion years. So um, when we talk about the chronology of life on Earth, we've got the Paleozoic, uh, which is really, you know, predominantly ocean-dwelling life, uh, fish, amphibians, primitive reptiles. The Mesozoic, which is this middle period uh, where reptiles really proliferated. This includes uh, the dinosaurs. Um, the Cenozoic, from 65 million years ago to the present. We are interested in this period with respect to anthropology because this is when we've got the origins of uh, the flowering plants and then the diversification of primates. And so each of these eras then is divided into periods. Each period is divided into epochs. Um, what we have to recognize is that at the end of the Mesozoic, beginning of the Cenozoic, so 65 million years ago, the continents were not in the places where they are now. So um, we would we were not Pangaea at that time, but um, we've got South and North America still connected to Europe. We've got South America much closer to Africa uh, than it is in current times. And so this is part of what kind of enabled um, primates to be widespread. This is why, for example, we find um, lemurs, uh, kind of proto lemurs in New Mexico, because North America was much warmer, much wetter, um, and these the continents weren't nearly as far apart as they are. So, you know, you think about the distance between South America and Africa today, and it's kind of like, oh my gosh, how could New World monkeys have ever made it all the way across? I mean, they'd have to raft or build boats or something. But at the time that monkeys were moving into the New World, into South America predominantly, um, you know, it wasn't quite as far as the leap. You've still got an ocean crossing, but a crossing that you can much more realistically imagine, like a downed tree floating across or something. As we divide the Cenozoic into periods, we've got the Quaternary period and the Tertiary period. The Tertiary is predominantly non-human primates. Uh, the end of the Tertiary and then the Quaternary period are hominins. Um, as we divide these periods then into epochs, um, we're going to talk about we're really going to capitalize upon uh, Planet of the Apes, okay? And so maybe this is really cheesy or whatever. First of all, Planet of the Apes cannot happen. Chimpanzees have been undergoing their separate evolutionary trajectory for, you know, about five, six million years. They are way specialized at being chimpanzees. You know, we can't just give them an injection for, like, Rise of Planet of the Apes of human DNA and expect them to stand up bipedally, wear clothes, and talk perfect English. So, you know, we got to recognize that, you know, it's, it's Hollywood, right? It's a lot of creative license. But we're going to use that Planet of the Blank <clears throat> as kind of how we describe these epics. So the first mammals really radiate during the Paleocene epoch, um, and we would consider the Paleocene to be um, the first appearance of prosimians. All right, so each of these epochs is going to be planet of the, and then first appearance of. So the Paleocene would be planet of the, I don't know, shrews, because primates evolved out of tree shrews. Okay, we really don't have to worry about what the planet is there, but it is the time when we first see uh, prosimians appear. The Eocene from 54 million years ago to about 35 million years ago would be planet of the prosimians. This is where prosimians abound. This is also going to be the time where the first anthropoids evolve. Okay, Anthropoids being of course these proto-monkey, proto-ape ancestors. The Oligocene from 34 to 24 million years ago is going to be planet of the monkeys. Um, this is when we start to see the divergence of old and new world monkeys. This is also going to be <clears throat> the point where the very first apes appear. The Miocene is going to be our collective planet of the apes. We have some times where we've got as many as a hundred species of proto-apes available. Um, and so dramatic ape diversity, you know, just unparalleled from what we see today. This would be also, though, that time period where the very first hominins appear. So, you know, next week we're going to talk about some fossils like Sahelanthropus chacadensis and Auroran that represent possibly our very first hominin. 
<clears throat> and they're going to appear late in the Miocene. So the Miocene goes 23 million to 5 million years ago. By the Pliocene, we're talking about planet of the Australopiths. Okay, we've got the appearance of uh, Artipithecus, we've got Australopithecus, multiple species. Um, we've got the emergence, because the, uh, the Pliocene goes until about 2 million years ago. We've got the appearance of the very first representatives of the genus Homo. The Pleistocene epoch um, would be Planet of the Homo. That sounds really kind of weird, but uh, you know it's this point where Homo as a genus has diversity with Rudolfensis, um, Neanderthalensis, so on and so forth, um, and it's where anatomically modern Homo sapiens appear. And then from the Holocene on, we're only—I mean, even before that—we're only talking about anatomically modern Homo sapiens. So you know, we've got Paleocene first. Persimians, Eocene, planet of the Persimians, first monkeys, Oligocene, planet of the monkeys, first apes, Miocene, planet of the apes, first hominins, Pliocene, planet of the Australopiths, first Homo, Pleistocene, planet of the Homo, first appearance of uh, anatomically modern Homo sapiens. So you don't really, <coughs> for the scope of the exam uh, next week, you don't really need to know. The date ranges, you just need to be able to recognize this planet of the and what first appeared. Primates evolved along with this expansion of flowering plants. I mean, it was this totally new ecological niche, uh, fruit eating, um, that happened during a long period of global warming that began around 56 million years ago. These key primate features did not appear all at once. You know, our teeth changed, then our noses changed, then our vision changed, so on and so forth. It was a gradual process. In the Paleocene, we've got the earliest primates uh, towards the end there, around 55 million years ago. In the Eocene from 54 to 34 million years ago, we've got so many kinds of prosimians. We've got 60 different genera of prosimians, including uh, Tarsier-like, Loris-like, and modern Lemur-like groups. In North America, we had uh, kind of primitive Tarsiers. We had also a group, the fossil that's uh, pictured here is, is Cope lemur, um, which was a proto-lemur uh, species that we had in New Mexico. Uh, they reached Africa by late in the Eocene, yet Africa is where they were able to persist more into modern times because Africa remained warm and wet, whereas as the continents drifted, um, it became <coughs> drier and cooler. <coughs> Ancestral lemurs would have also reached Madagascar during this time because it, it had not yet moved away from the continent of Africa. Uh, these proto-monkeys first branch off. Um, their eyes start to rotate forward, which gives them the stereoscopic vision for the lemurs that were proto-lemurs that were present. Their eyes were still, if you look at cope lemur here, more on the side of their head. They get a fully encased eye socket that helps to protect the eyes, uh, and their dry nose starts to separate from their upper lip. They lose the vomeronasal organ. By the end of the Eocene, many strepsirenes or prosimians were extinct. Uh, because proto-monkeys did so much better at exploiting this fruit-eating diurnal niche. The Oligocene has a lot of geological and climatic changes. This is when the um, the continents really start to shift into their modern day positions. And so we've got two <coughs> kind of proto-groups uh, that date to uh, this period called the Fayum, where we've got um, what we call Propriopithecids and Parapithecids. These are the groups that are ancestral to what become Old World and New World, world monkeys. So we'll see those on the next slide. But uh, New World monkeys are considered more primitive monkeys. Old World monkeys are considered um, more uh, more advanced or more uh, derived. And so one of the ways, of course, when we're looking at monkey fossils that we tell Old World from New World, right? We already talked about with our extant primates the way the nostrils face and whether they have a pre prehensile tail or not. But when all you've got are skulls, you can't really get those features, right? So what we look at for this difference between Old World and New World <coughs> fossil monkeys <coughs> is the dental formula. You know, think about your own mouth, right? We've got, if you divide your mouth into quadrants, that it is upper right, upper left, lower right, lower left. You've got two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and if you have wisdom tooth, teeth, three molars. If you don't have wisdom teeth, two molars, right? That's a very derived dental formula. 
Well, it's also with the three molars is what we see apes having. It's, it's what we see old world monkeys having. What new world monkeys have are two incisors, one canine, three premolars, and three molars. And so that is much more shrew-like. Shrews also have three premolars. So if all we have is a skull, we can still tell whether that species is old world or new world on the basis of that dental formula. So three premolars is the primitive condition, two premolars is the derived condition. You need those three premolars when you're eating insects. You don't need them as much when you're eating fruit. That's one of the reasons why we've lost them. And so, and during this oligocene, that's where we become really focused on fruit eating. And though, you know, this is written in uh, a different alphabet, um, we've got the kind of precursors here, the parapathecids that give rise to new world monkeys, and we've got the propyliopathecids that give rise to old world monkeys. You can already see different snout shapes, right? This is more prognathous. This seems to end rather abruptly with this kind of flat, uh, flat face, flat nasal area. Um, so we're looking at this difference in dental formula. We're starting to see changes in shapes to the snout. At the end of the Oligocene, we see the appearance of the first apes. Um, hominoids date to the Miocene. Um, that is, you know, this uh, group with all living and extant apes, uh, these proto-apes. We've got some really early Miocene proto-apes that have become very widespread, including Proconsul. We will see Proconsul in another slide or two. Um, Proconsul we have it at sometimes at least three known species widespread across Africa. However, by the middle of the Miocene, Proconsul had died out and been replaced by other apes. So here's Proconsul. Proconsul was very abundant and very successful, had teeth that were similar to modern apes. So what does that mean? Well, you know, we're not looking at teeth here uh, for this class, right? This is not a dental anthropology class. Um, and particularly when we take this class online, we're limited in what we can do um, in terms of handling skulls. But um, the molar shape on apes and humans is different than the molar shape on monkeys. And so specifically the way the cusps are oriented, we get uh, grooves that are shaped like a Y on ape teeth. And so when we talk about teeth that are more ape-like, we're talking about things like that. How are the cusps arranged? and <clears throat> what shape does the groove make. In monkeys it's more of an X shape of grooves. So we've got a shifting of cusps on the molars. The skeleton below the neck was more monkey-like. If you look here at the arms and legs of Proconsul, for example, they are basically um, you know, the same length. We haven't yet reached that point where arms are much longer than, uh, than legs. So we're seeing a dietary shift and, and other skull shifts that are associated with perhaps an enlarging brain, um, but we're not seeing the rest of the skeleton catching up yet. We've got some real doozies as we look at some of the later Miocene hominids. Uh, we've got, for example, or hominoids, we've got, for example, Gigantopithecus. Um, if you've watched the most recent um, Jungle Book, the one that is the live action CGI one, they have King Louis in that one being Gigantopithecus instead of just being an orangutan. Gigantopithecus only appeared in Asia, persisted from you know the Miocene about 16 million years ago, all the way until about 400,000 years ago. It coexisted with Homo erectus in areas like Vietnam um, and China. It was the largest ape that ever lived, could reach 1,200 pounds and 10 to 12 feet tall, um, and, and pretty widespread across Asia. And so there is the possibility that this is the source for, uh, for folklore, right? I mean, this Gigantopithecus here looks an awful lot like Bigfoot, like Sasquatch, like Yeti. Um, and so the source of these myths could be f uh, oral traditions that are passed down from the time, really, that language first emerges as, as a means of learning about your environment and sharing information. So um, our Sasquatch, Bigfoot, Yeti myths may date back to Homo erectus or archaic Homo sapiens and may have been passed down for that many generations. Pretty phenomenal. Now this, this guy was a vegetarian, so you can get really large uh, body size on an entirely vegetarian diet. And we can imagine what would lead to uh, this particular group uh, becoming extinct. I mean, again, it's going to be habitat destruction and it's going to be competition from 
um, from hominins, from humans, right? Um, I mean, something this large would be sought after meat-wise uh, because it'd be able to feed a lot of people. And then the last hominin fo or hominoid fossil we're going to talk about is Paralopithecus catalunicus. This may be the last common ancestor that we share with great apes. Um, it also could be spaced slightly differently and be the last common ancestor that we share with hominids, that is the African apes, excluding orangutans. Lived around 13 million years ago, the richest fossils come from Spain, uh, weighed about 75 pounds, so a bit smaller um, than uh, a bit smaller than our um, you know, modern day apes, but uh, has a diet that really suggested much longer arms, a much more upright posture, climbing trees with this orthograde posture and the shoulder girdle kind of rotating outward, um, knuckle walking when on the ground. Um, so definitely features of great apes that are different from uh, lesser apes and different from monkeys. And the single diet that we see suggests fruit. We see, uh, we see on on the tooth that we're not looking at anything that shears like vegetable material. Um, we've got the shape of the tooth and the thickness of the enamel indicative of a really soft diet. I mean, the thing about fruit is it doesn't even require very much <coughs> chewing apparatus to be able to uh, successfully eat it. So, you know, one of the differences, like in skull shapes between orangutans and gorillas or between chimps and gorillas, you know, gorillas have this massive sagittal crest and everybody's like, oh, look, it's like for displays and to be aggressive. No, it simply is an anchor point for massive chewing muscles that kind of wrap around the outside of the face and go through the, the cheek arch. So when you eat a diet that is plant-based but like leaf and grass based you need massive chewing muscles keep this in the back of your mind towards next week because we're going to talk about a distinction between gracile and robust australopiths and the robust australopiths have massive sagittal crests and brow ridges again not to look intimidating but uh, serve as anchor points for these massive muscles so the reason that chimps have a much more diminutive skull is because they're not eating thick, fibrous, tough vegetation. They're eating ripe fruit. I mean, we give bananas to babies before babies even have teeth. You know, it's not something that requires a lot of chewing, a lot of mastication. And so the lineage of monkeys split off around 25 million years ago from hominoids. The ancestors of the lesser apes split off from great apes around 16 to 15 million years ago. The orangutan line diverges somewhere around 12, 11, 10 million years ago. And this, around this 7 to 6 million year mark, we see a divergence that gives rise to modern hominins. So I've got this illustration here just because there are a number of ways that we can draw our phylogenetic trees. At the beginning of this lecture, we had it drawn completely differently, right? With humans as that penultimate at the end point. Here we've got uh, a tree that then further talks about this three million years ago where uh, chimps and bonobos split. So we are at our core primates. We like to think we're special. We certainly have much bigger brains, more complex culture. You know, we'll talk about how these things emerge over the coming weeks, but, uh, but biologically we are um, primates and you know, there's nothing to be ashamed about about with that. So in summary, be able to um, discuss how humans relate to other primates in terms of zoological taxonomy, distinguish between analogies and homologies, consider the scope and subject matter of primatology and how it relates to anthropology as a whole, identify these six primary trends in primate evolution, know what the prosimians are, where they live, how they're related to other primates, be able to distinguish between old and new world monkeys, be able to distinguish among the apes, be able to point out both similarities and differences between humans and non-human primates, um, be able to do all of these planets of the, right? Be able to link uh, the, um, the Eocene, the Oligocene, the Miocene, um, and so forth with the appropriate species. Uh, be able to identify specifically Proconsul Giganopithecus and Paralopithecus catalunicus and then understand these threats that are facing primates around the world.